Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Well, hey there, pet parent. Welcome back. Thank you for joining me on the Pet Parenting Reset. Today, we are talking about some drugs that we need to be avoiding pretty much at all cost for our dogs and our cats. If you are part of the Patreon family, then we have talked about this in the past, and I'm going to reference some of that information. Um, If you're not part of the Patreon family, I highly recommend that you join. It's a really cool little family we have going on over there with exclusive content, um, new content, behind the scenes, all kinds of wonderful things that you can join for as little as a dollar a month. It helps me to continue to bring content like this to you. So you can check, uh, you can go to the petparentingreset.com and there's a link right there at the top for Patreon and it'll get you there. And uh, yeah, so it's a really cool platform because unlike a lot of other social media platforms, you actually get the content you sign up for. (laughs) which is why I started it. So I do hope you check that out. But we're going to be talking today about flea and tick medication or preventatives or whatever it is that you call them. They're pretty much all the same. The ones that you get, whether you get them from a pet store or your veterinarian, we're going to be talking about them because I almost like, look, there are always exceptions to the rule. However, in most cases, I absolutely do not recommend using them. I haven't used them in many, many years, and we'll talk all about that. So while we're talking about why we shouldn't be using these chemicals on our dogs, they are all they all have neurological side effects. And we're going to talk about that. But I'm at the end, I want you to know that I am going to be bringing you suggestions for safe flea and tick prevention. So don't worry, this is not all doom and gloom. I am going to be providing you with some much safer alternatives, so make sure you stick around for that. So while flea and tick medication, there are a few different active ingredients in these medications. There are some that are more widely used than others. A fipronil is one of them. Isoxazoline, I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> it's a long word. Isoxazoline is another one. And those the, those two are in some of the biggest name brand uh, flea and tick prevention, flea and tick medications, whatever you want to call them, on the market. And what's really interesting is that not only are there physical side of pe- effects, but we also see emotional side effects and cognitive um, behavioral side effects in in not just our dogs and cats, but in all mammals have been studied. So there was uh, one study recently called or titled The Effects of Fipronil on Emotional and Cognitive Behaviors in Animals and in Mammals, excuse me. So this study was really, really interesting (laughs) because um, Fipronil is one of those uh, really, really popular neurologics. So just a brief overview of how flea and tick prevention, flea and tick medication works. The idea is that this medication that you put on your dog or on your cat, or even if they like they can ingest the tablets or it's a a liquid medication that you put like kind of right between um, the shoulder blades, the front shoulder blades, right? Those are some of the very um, most popular. Of course, there are, you know, collars and things like that. They, they use similar uh, medications inside of them. So what happens is what, what, The medication is supposed to do is when a flea or a tick bites your dog or cat. So it's not preventing them being bitten, but when a flea or a tick bites your dog or cat and they ingest your pet's blood, their blood has these chemicals in it that are designed to attack the neurological um, 
pathways in the flea or the tick, which ultimately will result in them not being able to breathe and dying. So that's in a nutshell, in a very non-scientific way, uh, because that's how I learned best, is how they work. Well, what's really, really unfortunate is that these neurologic side effects, well, our dogs and our cats are not immune to them by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, there are very significant side effects and a lot of animal, like a lot of animals have very unfortunately died. Um, even more have very serious uh, neurologic symptoms. They suffer from um, seizures is one big one, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. So one of the really interesting, the, the study that I was just bringing up, the emotional and cognitive side effects actually studied how when you apply that topical flea or tick medication, flea and tick medication, where it travels in the body. And it literally travels everywhere in the body. Um, one of the quotes uh, of this study says that fipronil goes in the body. It goes through and resides in the adipose tissue, the testes, the liver, the adrenal glands, the kidneys, the spleen, the heart, the olfactory bulbs, and the cerebellum, which is the brain, after the dermal, which is skin, application. So what they know is that it causes disruption in the GABA receptors in the brain. So we know that uh, it, you may have recently heard, I believe it was in 2020 or 2021, um, in England, they were studying bodies of water and they found that there was fipronil poisoning in the water. It was affecting um, water dwelling species, fish and, and everything else that is living in the waterways in England because these chemicals are getting in the water and poisoning, poisoning the water and everything in it. It's really, really, really unfortunate. So fipronil, this particular uh, drug, which I said there, there are a couple of them out there, fipronil and isoxazoline, I hope I'm saying that right, <laughs> are two of the most prevalent. So fipronil is in um, Frontline, Barricade, Easy Spot, Effapro, Sentry, Fipragard, Paristar, Pet Armor, Pronal, OTC, and Spectrasure, just to name a few. <laughs> um, there are, what's really, really interesting, uh, isoxazoline, for one, has many adverse reactions and deaths reported on it as, as well as fipronil. Um, seizures, deaths, and other adverse reactions. These are really, really serious and significant side effects of a flea and tick medication that you, um, going into your veterinarian, I mean, how many, what was the last time your veterinarian gave you the risk and benefit um, analysis on a, on a flea and tick medication? I mean, that's important to ask. And when your vet, the next time you go in and they do offer it to you or tell you that your pet needs it, ask them for the risk versus benefits of giving this drug to your pet. Um, especially, goodness, goodness knows, knowledge is power, right? Because we know, we know all of the side effects, in my opinion, maybe, maybe for you and your dog, they don't outweigh, outweigh the benefit, maybe. But for me, the risks definitely outweigh the benefit. So some side effects of neurologic drugs include paralysis or weakness of the limbs, tingling, numbness, or other sensations of the limbs, headache, vision loss, cognitive dysfunction, and loss of memory, obsessive and or compulsive behaviors, sometimes uncontrollable, behavioral problems, depression, poor circulation, imbalance, and flu-like symptoms. So uh, the most popular ones containing isoxazoline include Brevecto, Credelio, NextGuard, Semperica, and Revolution. So uh, again, we're going to talk about safe flea and tick prevention at the end of this, so make sure you stick around. I'm not just giving you all doom and gloom today. But what we do know is that to me, at least, <laughs> the risks far outweigh, outweigh the rewards. So I'm going to pull up that I, I follow a number of different veterinarians and every single one of them that I follow is just vehemently against 
these flea and tick preventions. Now, updated numbers um, on some of the most popular, this is information from Dr. Katie Woodley. She's another one that I, I follow um, who does not recommend flea and tick prevention. Updated numbers on some of the most popular flea and tick preventatives. Next guard, um, this, uh, uh, this is 2021 information. Next guard, in the past five years, since it was approved by the FDA as safe and effective, has had 1,315 seizures reported. Now, these are just what has actually been reported. By far, I think people don't report these. Now, you as a consumer may report it to your veterinarian, but is your veterinarian reporting back to the FDA? Hmm. As a consumer, it's actually our responsibility to report it to the FDA. So uh, know that for next time. Your, your vet is almost, almost guaranteed not to be reporting to the FDA. You can ask them about it for sure because there are, of course, going to be some of them out there that do. But as a consumer of a product, um, it is ultimately your responsibility to report any negative side effects to the FDA. So these are just what's been reported. Brevecto, 720 reports of seizures in four years. Semperica, 557 reported seizures in three years. Credelio, um, six seizures in the first six months it was approved. But again, um, all of these numbers are much, much higher now. And uh, the reporting, we believe, is very, very, very low. So there are, again, plenty, plenty, plenty of much more safe and effective flea and tick preventions uh, out there. Just as kind of a side note, um, the last time I gave any flea or tick prevention to any of my pets was to one of my cats who had a chronic ear infection. This was years ago. This was probably, oh goodness, maybe a good six, maybe even seven years ago. Um, he was having some chronic ear infections. And let me tell you, I have learned a lot <laughs> in the last six or seven years. And the vet that we were currently seeing um, as part of the treatment suggested that I also give him revolution, which is a topical um, that goes in between the shoulder blades. And when I gave it to him, he got a nasty chemical burn. Like it was not like... Oh my gosh, I felt so horrible <laughs> that I gave that to him. And do you know, I told the vet about it and he was like, huh, that's weird. And nothing else happened. And of course, back then, I didn't know what I know now. So I, I'm telling you, I didn't report it to the FDA. I definitely should have. Um, but I didn't. And that's that's on me. But as a consumer, I now know that that is my responsibility to do. One other drug that is also a flea and tick preventative is trifexis. Now, trifexis doesn't have fipronil or isoxazoline. Instead, it's a combination of two drugs that are found in other products. Um, the first being spinosad and the second being milbamycin. I hope I'm saying this right. <laughs> milbamycin and spinosad. Um, so Spinosad is a pesticide which is sourced in the United States. That main ingredient is in Comfortis, which is a flea killer. And then the milbamycin is a pesticide sourced in China, and it's the main ingredient in Interceptor. So those are the two primary uh, drugs found in Trifexis. So for information on Trifexis, I went to Dr. Will Falconer, who you have definitely heard me talk about in the past. Um, he is one of the veterinarians I follow, and he's actually a homeopathic veterinarian. So some of the real people with real experience um, with their dogs being harmed by taking Trifexis, some of these uh, reports include failure of the product to get rid of hookworms, which is one of their claims. Um, dogs refusing the dose because they got ill on the first dosage. Blindness immediately post trifexis dosed from detached retinas. So that's pretty serious. Death. Um, back in 2013, we knew of at least 700 that were uh, killed from trifexis, but that was in 2013. That was almost 10 years ago. So guaranteed that number has gone up. Uh, vomiting is of course a very, very common side effect because it is a, it, it's 
poison, right, that we're giving to our pets. So trifexis is something that uh, it's, it's like a, a chewable tablet type. It's, it's not the liquid type that you put on. So um, pets actually refusing it makes sense when I, when I put it in that context. And then vomiting again, because the body is saying, no, I'm not, this is not supposed to be in my body. Uh, pancreatitis has also been reported. Something called fly biting, or uh, which is an air snapping behavior. It's one of those um, OCD type behaviors that we talked about previously. Um, and also uh, epilepsy becoming very common in dogs that have been taking trifexis. Seizures, of course, we know this, it's, it's a neurological drug. Confusion, um, restless wandering, weakness in the rear, rear limbs, including paralysis, heart disease, lethargy, and um, hypersensitivity. So really sensitive to touch, um, maybe biting because they are in pain, are overly sensitive. Those things are all being reported in dogs who take trifexis. So these are very, very serious. So if we go back to the isoxazoline, which is again, Brevecto, Brevecto Plus, Nexgard, Semperica, Semperica Trio, Credelio, Revolution, um, and Revolution Plus, there are, uh, Dr. Judy Morgan is, is a big, big advocate for not using any flea and tick medications, but especially isoxazoline. And what she is noticing in her clients, as well as other clients from other veterinarians that she has pulled um, from isoxazoline, these dogs are experiencing aggression, personality changes, seizures, disorientation, wobbling or unstable gait, sensitivity to touch, abnormal vocalizations, urinary or fecal incontinence, and death. Um, other side effects include liver failure, kidney failure, dry eye, clotting disorders, internal hemorrhage, skin disease, and itching, vomiting, diarrhea, inappetence, and drooling. So first and foremost, if your animal is currently taking any of these medications, there is hope. <laughs> now, if you believe your animal is having an adverse reaction to any of these medications, you definitely want to first consult with your veterinarian about it. And there are some detox protocols that there are that vet, veterinarians, um, specifically Dr. Judy Morgan and Dr. Karen Becker have out there to help detox your dog from these chemicals. Um, I know milk, milk thistle is a very, very popular one, but there are other things. Chlorella is another one. Um, and then there are some uh, Chinese herbs that can also be uh, really good at, at helping um, detox the liver and the kidneys. So if your vet doesn't know what to do or you're having a hard time talking with them and you, you feel like, again, this is why, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of having a medical team for your pet. Uh, you can find veterinarians, holistic veterinarians, homeopathic veterinarians that will do consults over the phone or online. And I would highly recommend doing that so that you can get your dog or cat um, off of these medications and healthy. So now that we have talked all about why these medications or preventatives are so incredibly dangerous for your pets, let's talk a little bit about some of the things you can do uh, in place of these traditional flea and tick medications. Some things that are still going to provide uh, prevention, right? So we don't want our dog or cat to be covered in fleas and ticks, and we certainly don't want them coming in our homes, uh, but that are actually safe for our pets and for us. So when we think about alternative prevention for fleas and ticks, the first thing to remember is that fleas and ticks are parasites, and parasites are attracted to weaker hosts. This is why in the wild, you'll notice that parasites are more attracted to the young, the old, and the sick. Young puppies and kittens don't yet have a fully developed immune system. Elderly pets have a weakened immune system due to age, and sickly animals also have weakened immune systems. So the number one thing that you can do, according to Dr. Will Falconer, who I was just mentioning um, in his Vital Animal podcast, which I highly recommend, is uh, the number one thing you can do to damage your pet the most is to over vaccinate them. I think we've talked about, I know I have talked about this many, many times. We've talked about this on Patreon for sure. And I have also talked about it on um, the video channels, YouTube and Rumble. So 
I think I am most free to say what I need to say on Patreon. Um, so I would, again, highly recommend you join the family over there. But over-vaccinating is one of the number one things you can do to damage your pet the most. This is absolutely going to weaken their immune system. And that isn't to say, again, I'm not, I'm not anti-vax. I'm anti-over-vaccination. Of course, we want to feed the best foods possible to our pets. We talk about this all the time. <laughs> but if you're feeding your dog a not so great diet, the turnaround uh, from switching to a fresh diet full of wonderful nutrients is actually fairly short. So from when you stop feeding not so great food to when you feed really good food, your dog can get significantly healthier in a very short period of time. And if you're using flea and tick medications, you can stop using them and reduce future damages. But with vaccines, you can't undo the damage once it's been done. Yes, we have definitely talked about over-vaccinating on Patreon. Go over there and check it out. Uh, go to thepetparentingreset.com, and at the very top, you can click on Patreon and join, again, for as little as a dollar a month. We have talked about that. Um, stop using toxins and pest control. Feed your pet the best food you possibly can. Outside of your home, for more natural pest control, there are so many things you can do. And here are some of the things that I'm going to be doing this spring because we just moved into a new house and it's winter right now. So not an ideal time for planting, but that's one of the things I'm going to be doing this spring is uh, planting lots of wonderful things. Catnip, rosemary, lemongrass, lavender. These are some of my favorite things. <laughs> um, we've, I, I know on Patreon, I talked about um, catnip being a mosquito repellent. So that's one additional be benefit for you and your family uh, because of the naturally occurring nepalectone is what it is called. Rosemary could have similar properties and both would also be effective for fleas. Cats in the wild will naturally rub catnip and other mint family plants on their fur for the pest repellent properties. Lemongrass is also known to work well against fleas. Lavender is not only beautiful and quite possibly my favorite plant of all, it's also known to repel ticks and scorpions, by the way. Um, so, <laughs> um, when we moved to California originally, we were faced with scorpions. I had never encountered a scorpion before in my life and I was freaked out. And that was one of the first things I learned was that lavender is a natural repellent. So I quickly went out and bought a lot of lavender <laughs> back then. Uh, one other thing I will be doing to the yard, and I actually did that, um, I've been doing it since we moved here, was using Wonderside in the yard. So Wonderside is a natural um, compound. It's, it's made of all natural ingredients and it uses essential oils of a lot of these things that we've talked about, um, and has some, there's like three or four different scents, I believe, um, to choose from. And they all work really, really well. There, are uh, some for use in the outside of the house and some for use on the inside of the house. And, uh, yeah, they're incredible. I've, I started using them right when we moved uh, out here to Texas and they have worked pretty darn well. So I, I can say for as long as I've used them, at least they've worked really, really well. They are very natural and I recommend them. Um, so for my dog specifically, she eats a healthy diet and um, she gets tighter tested. So she's not being over vaccinated. So I'm not too worried about her health in general. I think she's, uh, she's strong. Her immune system is strong. Um, she is not an ideal host for parasites, period. However, um, I do, when it's warm enough outside for bugs, use a bug spray on her, but it is not a traditional bug spray that you can just buy at any old store. No, no, no. Um, I use Animalio Evict or Away. I alternate between the two and I have spray bottles that I fill with distilled water. And then I will either add in Evict or Away, depending on what I'm feeling that time. And yeah, it's incredible. It smells wonderful. It works very, very well. In fact, um, Dr. Melissa Shelton, who created the Animalio line of products, she <laughs> did a field test live on, 
I think Facebook, um, maybe a year or two ago as of the recording of this podcast. And she had one sock uh, that she did not spray with, I think she was using a whey. And then the other sock that she did spray with a water mist of a whey. And she went out in the field, found a tick, and the sock that she did not have a whey sprayed on, it just crawled straight up because that's what ticks naturally will do. The other sock where she did have a way sprayed, she sprayed it like at the ankle line. It would not pass the ankle line. So it was going back down, trying to get away from it. So it was really, really interesting um, to see exactly how it works. It's, it, yeah, it was, it was incredible. And I would highly recommend <laughs> you seeking that out. Coconut oil is also a great food addition, which will help keep the fleas away. It can also be rubbed onto your dog's coat. It works well due to the lauric acid that it contains, which repels pests like fleas. If necessary, I can also add small amounts of garlic to Kim's meals. Garlic is typically said to be toxic to dogs, but this is only true with large quantities, like really large quantities, everything in moderation. In small amounts, garlic is a natural antiparasitic and has immune boosting properties. So for my cats, they are primarily indoors. Uh, so I don't do much of anything for them outside of, I no longer over vaccinate them. I don't use toxins as pest control and I feed them the best foods that I can feed them that they will eat. <laughs> um, however, if I need it, that same uh, spray that I was talking about, the distilled water mixed with drops of animalio, either the evict or the away would be the same thing I would use on my cats, except instead of spraying it on them directly, they wouldn't accept that. Cats aren't going to accept that, right? Spray it onto your hands and then rub it in to their fur. So that would be my go-to there. There is also a product called Flea X by the two crazy cat ladies. It is, um, they rebranded to Feline Essentials. So that's the brand of the product, Feline Essentials. And it's called Flea X. And it works in the same way. You spray it on your hands and then you rub it onto your cat's coat. It's good for dogs as well. Um, but I have a lot of animalia around the house. So that's what I use. So there it is in a nutshell, why these traditional flea and tick preventatives or medications are not so great for your pets. Uh, definitely, in my opinion, I will not be using them on my pets, um, though I can see there may be extenuating circumstances out there. It's, it's your decision on what you do for your pets and what you think is going to be the best for your pets in your unique circumstance, because we all have a unique circumstance, right? So never say never, but for me, I will not be uh, using these traditional flea and tick medications on my pets ever again. I have plenty of natural and safe alternatives for flea and tick prevention available to me and my pets. And that is what I'm going to be. I have been using for years and will continue to use for as long as <laughs> as long as I have pets. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and end today's podcast. Again, I, you know, I've mentioned twice already about joining the family over on Patreon, and I really do hope to see you over there. Go to the petparentingreset.com and click on the Patreon tab. Um, yeah, I, I hope this was informative. If it was, please share this podcast with anyone, you know, that has pets because so many people are using these without knowing or understanding the side effects um, which are just effects of the drug. Uh, I really, I, I don't like the term side effects because it implies that they may or may not really be an effect of the, they are, they are an effect of the drug. They're just an effect of the drug that the manufacturer doesn't want you to pay attention to. <laughs> to. <laughs> um, so with that, give your pets some extra love from me and until next time guys. Bye. Oh, oh.